we have been on the road to resurrection through probation and persecution, penitence and prodigality, perfume and processional. And we come this morning to resurrection power. And I want to look at an Easter faith in a Good Friday world. An Easter faith in a Good Friday world. There is a principle in Bible study known as the first mention principle. But the principle I want to look at this morning is called the full mention principle. This is the principle by which God declares his full mind on any subject that is vital to our spiritual development. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when the subject of love is given full treatment, and James chapter 3, when the tongue is addressed in full mention, are examples of the full mention principle. When God has declared his full mind on the subject of love, and on the power of the tongue. This principle is also in view here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In this monumental passage, the Apostle Paul addresses in singular detail the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This doctrine, this full mention doctrine, this doctrine of the resurrection, Paul's treatment on the resurrection is one of the most important doctrines of the Bible. Further, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have believed a false gospel. We have nourished an empty faith. Our foreparents have died clinging to a baseless hope. And we are more to be pitied than men who had had less splendid dreams and less utter illusions. The way to prove a fact is by the evidence of witnesses. We have the testimony of the women at the tomb. We have Peter and Paul. We have the testimony of all of the disciples and 500 witnesses at one time who all saw the risen Christ. It is also a documented fact of secular history. The resurrection is not just biblical history. There is a record of it in secular history. The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived shortly after the time of Christ, writes, now that was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to even call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such awesome power that men received his truth with pleasure. Josephus goes on to say that when Pilate had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive, Josephus says, the third day, as the divine prophets 
had already foretold. And the tribe of Christians so named from him, Josephus says, are still alive to this day. He lives. I know what the women said. I know what Peter and Paul said. I know what all the apostles and the disciples said. I know what the 500 brethren at once said. I know what Josephus said, but I know in my own soul. I'm my own witness that Christ is alive. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just throw this in here parenthetically. The reason why we shout and carry, so on, carry on so much in our faith and in our church is because we don't worship a shrine or a cruciform or a crucifix with a dead Jesus. Because if Christ is still dead, we can get out of here and go home right now. But I serve a risen Savior. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. And the reason why you and I are up so early this morning is because early one Sunday morning, Jesus got up from the grave. God raised him up. Um, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is a waste of time. If Christ is not risen, our faith is foolishness. If Christ is not risen, all we Christians are liars. Lost in our sins. Our departed loved ones are gone forever. And we are to be pitied as fools for building our lives and our hopes on the corpse of a dead man. I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. Um, New Testament scholar and Pauline theologian and Anglican bishop N.T. Wright said this. N.T. Wright said, the resurrection is an indication that the cross worked. I wish I would have said that. N.T. Wright said that the resurrection is an indication that the cross really worked. The only reason Easter is such a happy time is because Good Friday was such a dark time. And the only thing that makes Good Friday make sense is Easter Sunday morning. Um, Paul's announcement is that the message of the Easter angels is true. By the power of God, Jesus conquered death and rose again from the dead. And because he lives, the graves of this world will yield a rich harvest of the redeemed when he comes back in his glory. Brothers and sisters, though infidels deny it, and intellectual elites and liberal thinkers call it foolishness, the resurrection is the cardinal doctrine of Christianity. Everything we believe and hold sacred stands or falls on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without it, we Christians have no foundation. We have no faith. 
We have no forgiveness and we have no future. But because of the resurrection, Dr. Dr. Max Lucado remarks that because of the resurrection, our lives are not futile. Our failures are not fatal. And our death is not final. Our lives are not futile. Our failures are not fatal. And our death is not final. Paul's conversion took place about five or six years after the resurrection while his writing of 1 Corinthians was written at the latest 27 years after the resurrection. Meaning that what we read and preach this morning, we are standing in the presence of absolute contemporaneous testimony. We were talking to somebody who was not there at the resurrection, but five years later, he was on the Damascus Road. I wish I had a Bible reader. And a bright light knocked him off his beast, and he fell to the ground and saw the resurrected Christ, and he said, I am an apostle born out of due season. And I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But Paul got the testimony you and I have. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now the sisters ought to shout right here. Because parenthetically, the gospel claims that the very first witnesses of the resurrection the very first people to see him alive were the women. Since women in that patriarchal culture were not allowed to give eyewitness testimony in court, there would be no plausible reason that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have invented them because they would not have listened to them otherwise. The only historically plausible reason that women would have been recorded in the gospel as seeing the risen Christ, the only plausible reason is they did. Because when you see something, it changes you. I wish I had somebody to help me here. I'm not talking about seeing with your eyes, because I've never seen Jesus. But I believe in my spiritual eye that he rose just like he said he did. So, what does Christ as the resurrected Lord Give us for life this morning. Colossians 1 verses 12 through 14 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But, but does, what does the resurrection still mean something today? Because many people are still believing that his spirit rose. It was a phantom that came out of the grave. It, it was some kind of ghost that came out of the grave. Because when he came out of the grave, the Bible says that his linen cloths were left in the grave in the form of his body. And the burial napkin that covered his face was to the side because when he walked out the door, just like when you get through with a meal, you drop your napkin saying you're finished. 
when he dropped that burial napkin at the door and he walked out, he said, I'm never coming back here again because it is finished. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. What does resurrection hope mean? How can we on this Easter Sunday have an Easter faith in a Good Friday world? What, what does the resurrection still do for us? Help me preach a minute. It gives us freedom from guilt. Freedom from guilt. The resurrection is a powerful sign to our consciences that Jesus fully paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. Let me, let me, let me see if I can make that make sense. If you've been accused of a crime that you actually committed, and went before a judge or a magistrate or a jury and you were found guilty of that crime. And you were sentenced to two years in prison. How do you know that you're free? When you walk out. You, you've paid your debt to society. You've served your time. You're free. You walk out. How do you know that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins on the cross? Because one Sunday morning, he walked out. Well, maybe you didn't get that. Um, perhaps you'll get this. You've been to Sam. Uh, Costco or uh, Walmart are there some stores in the Galleria where, where the cashier is at the back of the store and you have to walk out and there's a person at Walmart or at, at Sam's or at Costco's when you walk out they want to know did you pay for what you have And when you get to the door at Sam's or Costco's or Walmart, there's a woman or a man there with a yellow marker. And they ask to see your receipt. And if you paid for it, she marks it and you walk out. One Friday, Jesus paid it all and this morning, when you look at my account, God has marked it paid in full. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm about to shout it. I ain't through yet. God the Father looks at us because of Christ and he sees a treasure. To the degree that we live in consciousness of that, we are free from the shame of anything that's in our past. I need somebody to hear me this morning because the devil will always try to bring up what you did yesterday and the day before that and 20 years ago but Christ paid for that. Well, Reverend, suppose I sin today. Christ paid for that. Reverend, suppose I mess up tomorrow. Christ paid for that. Romans chapter 8. And verse number one says, there is therefore now. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven. There is therefore now 
no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Whatever we have done, whatever we are doing or ever will do is no match for the grace of God. Samuel Gandhi writes, well may the accuser roar of ills that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. But Jehovah, he knows none. I am free from the guilt of my past. Whatever I have done, whatever I'm doing now, whatever I'm going to do, when the accuser comes before God to recommend my punishment, Jesus stands up at the right hand of power and says to God the Father, I know he's guilty, but I paid for that. And the Father looks at me through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not Terry Anderson. I have freedom from guilt. Oh, brothers and sisters, not only am I free from my guilt, but I have freedom from the fear of death. The resurrection guarantees and proves that just as Christ was raised by the power of God, so also will be every Christian here this morning. Um, th that was a ceremony in the, in, in the Passover uh, uh, ceremony. There was a, there's, a, there's a ceremony in the Passover that's called the waving of the sheave offering. And the waving of the sheave offering in the Passover ceremony is that the, the, the first barley sheave to come out of the field is waved in the presence of God, signifying that just, this is just the beginning of what's to come. Jesus, at the resurrection, was the first fruits. Waving before God that there's more to come. Listen to this. this. This is the best line in this sermon. If you don't shout, I'm going to be so mad. Death pre-resurrection was an executioner. But death post-resurrection is an usher. Death used to be an executioner, but now it's an usher. If you are a believer, death is not an executioner. It ushers you into the presence of the living God. Absent from the body hey, is present with the Lord. We know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building immediately not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. Pre-resurrection, death was a blind alley that led to nothingness. But post-resurrection, death is an open door which leads into eternal life. Pre-resurrection, death was the period that ended the great sentence of life. Post-resurrection, death is a comma 
which punctuates it to more lofty significance. One of these days, you're going to pick up the Houston Chronicle and read in the obituary column that Terry Anderson is dead. That will be a misprint. Because I'll be more alive then than I've ever been before. I will drop this mantle of flesh. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. Step out of the narrow circumscriptions of time and into the illimitable expanses of eternity and I'm going home to be with God and if you are a child of God, we will meet together, not at Houston Memorial Garden. Not at Paradise North, not at Paradise South, but at a sea of glass. mingled with fire and there will be thousands and ten thousands of angels singing blessings and glory wisdom and power God has gotten him the victory over the beast and over the number of his name hallelujah the Lord God omnipotent reigneth I know what the Jehovah's Witnesses are saying that only 100 and 44,000 are going to be in heaven. That's partially true. That's 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. But John said, I saw another number that no man could number. Coming from the north and the south and the east and the west and they had on white robes. That's the number I'm going to be in. The number of those who have been redeemed who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Will you be there? I said, will you be there? Jesus is getting us ready for that great day. Who shall be able to stay? The kingly triumph over death is partially but not fully here and now. Even though we, we still must physically die, nevertheless, death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. In that same 8th chapter of Romans, Paul said, I'm persuaded. I need two or three people here who read the Bible. I am persuaded that neither life nor death, angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come, nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God. I've kept you here long enough. We are free, brothers and sisters, from guilt. We are free from the fear of death. But finally, we have freedom from what has enslaved us. You need to make up your mind this morning that you're going to be somebody's slave. Either you are a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. But you are going to serve a master. Colossians at chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. When the world looked at Jesus dying on the cross, the world only saw weakness and defeat. But in reality, on that cross, D Jesus had a double triumph. He destroyed the debt we owed to God, and then he made an open shame of the enemies of our souls that made us enemies of God in the first place. 
Can I make that make sense? For every person in here, I'm through. For every person in here this morning, there is a permanent record somewhere. Your grades from kindergarten all the way up to senior high school have been kept in a record. And those permanent records can determine whether or not you can enter college or not based on your record. There's a financial record of you. That whenever you go to apply for a loan for a house or a car, you could be denied because of your credit score from TransUnion or Equifax. You could be denied credit based on your past history that's locked and kept in a permanent record. You're going to help me close this, won't you? If you apply for a job, they do a criminal background check. And there might be something shady on your record that hinders you from getting employment. You can't hardly rent an apartment now unless they do a background check. You, you, you can't get a job now unless they do a background check. And if something shows up on your record, it could cost you employment. You're going to help me close this, won't you? People may be holding a record of you, true or not, called your reputation. You may not even be guilty of what they're talking about. You might not even know what they're talking about. But once people form an opinion of you in their mind, that could become a permanent record. You're going to help me close this, won't you? I talked to a friend of mine who worked at the county courthouse. And he said uh, sometimes on his job, people come in uh, and they, they, they bring with them all of their information because they have to handle some business at the county. And they bring their records with them and sometimes their age does not match the record. And, and so he said he thought that they were running a scam because you know we know every trick in the book uh, to get around doing what's right. If we just spend as much time doing right as we spend doing wrong, we, we could really get ahead. But he said this man came in and his birth date, his age uh, that he gave the people in the office did not match the birth date on his birth certificate. And so he said he thought something was strange about it, so he, he went in and talked with his supervisor. And his supervisor said, don't, don't, don't be alarmed. Don't, don't pay that much attention. It happens a lot of times. He said, she said, this may be the first time you run up against it, but it happens a lot of times that people's age that they give us do not match their permanent record. Yeah. My boy said, w w what does that mean? H help me so that when it happens the next time, I won't, I won't be taken aback. She said, when their age that they give us does not match the record that we have on them, it means that they've been adopted. And when they have been adopted, everything that happened prior to the adoption has been sealed. I, I wasn't born a Jew. I, I wasn't born of the tribe of Zebulon. I'm, I'm not in the tribe of Manasseh or I'm, I'm not in the tribe of Reuben or Judah or Dan. I'm not a Hebrew by my birth, but I've been adopted. Somebody ought to help me close here. And you can search all you want. My adoption records have been sealed. That anything that happened prior to my adoption, the blood of Jesus has already sealed it. I wish I had one or two more believers in here. 
people are always trying to bring up what you used to be. And you ought to be man enough or woman enough to own that and tell them that is what I used to be. But if any man would be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. I wish I had a Christian in here to help me. Behold, all things are becoming brand new. Is there anybody here got your adoption papers with you? Is there anybody here know you've been saved? You don't care what they say about you. Let them look at you while you shout this morning. Let them laugh at you because you're giving God the glory this morning. Let them talk about you because you're giving God all the praise this morning. The reason I praise God so much today is living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified me. Freed me forever. One day, one day, he's coming back. What a glorious day. Is there anybody here know he's coming back again? Is there anybody here getting your house in order because he's coming back again? Is there anybody here got your adoption papers in your hand? Is there anybody here know that no matter how much you've sinned, God still loves you. No matter how many laws you've broken, God still loves you. No matter how many commandments you've broken, God still loves you. That's why you shout so much. That's why you give God praise so much. Because you got so much to be thankful for so much to be grateful for why don't you take a minute right now and look back over look back over your life see where God brought you from not only where he brought you from but what he brought you through not only what he brought you from and brought you through but what he kept you from you could have been a drug addict but he kept you from it you could have been a prostitute but he kept you from it you could have been in prison this morning but he kept you from it you could have been dead but he kept you from it thank you Jesus thank you Jesus why don't you look at the person standing next to you? Tell him, I don't know what he brought you from. I don't know what he brought you through. I don't know what he kept you from. But if you know him, tell him, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.